At this point, I've reviewed a fair few gaming laptops, tested a whole load of different CPU and GPU combinations, and in those reviews, uh, specifically for the CPUs, I normally talk about the power consumption. You'll see graphs just like this, showing peak power usage under full load, normally while rendering the gooseberry scene in Blender, or one like this, showing the stable power draw, where the chip finally sits and rests when it drops down off of boost. But there's one graph I almost never show, and that's this, the temperatures. But why, I hear you ask? Well, Take a look, here is the last 23 laptops and modes that I have tested. Can you notice the problem? The lowest result here is, what, 91 degrees Celsius? It doesn't matter if it's a thick boy monster, a literal Xeon workstation, or a thin and light ultrabook, they are all over 90 degrees Celsius, and most sit at 95 or higher. It doesn't even matter if it's a Ryzen chip or from Intel, they all run real hot. But again, why? Well, let me explain. But first, a message from this video sponsor, Azrock. Their Z590 Steel Legend Wi-Fi 6E motherboard supports both Intel's 10th and 11th generation CPUs, features 14-phase Dr. Moss power design, PCI Gen 4 M.2 SSD supports, of course Wi-Fi 6E, and ASRock's graphics card holder that comes included in the box, and you can find out more about it at the link in the description below. I think it's best to start by providing some context. I'll show you that graph again, but this time include a couple of desktop CPUs. See the difference? Even a 12 core, 142 watt chip can sit in the 60 to 70 degrees Celsius range under full load, which compared to the 60 watt 8 core uh, laptop chips you generally see, that's an absolute monster and yet runs almost a third cooler. In fact, when it comes to desktop parts, Anything above about 80 degrees Celsius is generally considered pretty toasty, and if any of your parts are even close to 90, that's generally seen as a problem you want to resolve. So if 90 is awful on a desktop, why do we just accept upwards of 95 in laptops? Well, in short, performance. Desktops have the advantage of drawing much more power, uh, which means that they can get a whole lot more performance out, whereas laptops, well, they don't have such luxury. We constantly demand more performance from them, and we always want the gap between laptop and desktop hardware as close as is humanly possible. So having their chips boost as hard as they possibly can and until they overheat and then basically have them ride that line and that limit until the workload's done is really the only way to squeeze out that extra performance and it means that you end up getting some rather impressive results. I mean, for some context, most of the eight core sort of mobile chips offer about the same performance as a desktop six core, like the 5600X or the 11600K, which considering the latter runs at almost 150 watts to do that sort of you know comparison compared to around the 60 watt mark for a mobile Ryzen chip or more like 90 watts for a mo mobile Intel one, well, that's rather impressive from the laptops. But why can't laptops just run the same power levels as the desktop chips and get all of the performance possible? Well, again, in short, the answer is physics. There are two main problems or main issues with running uh, higher power CPUs in laptops, heat and power delivery. Let's start with the latter. Even if you rule out uh, running full power when the laptop's on battery, to draw 140 watts from the CPU alone, you would need to use a power brick capable of delivering a fair bit more than standard. Even a 240 watt power brick isn't really feasible, which is why many of those sort of insane beastly laptops actually come with two power supplies instead. 
you then have to deliver that power to the CPU through the VRMs, which to manage the amount of power you will need, need to be rather beefy. And both of those things add cost and to some degree weight as well. The biggest issue by far though is heat. Remember that desktop CPU that draws 142 watts? Well, this is what you need to cool it. It is a 240 millimeter AIO liquid cooler and the radiator on this alone is easily twice as thick if not more than the entire laptop and this is just the cooler. The motherboard itself has its own heat sinks for those beefy VRMs and plenty of airflow to keep everything cool. Compare all of this to what has to fit inside a laptop's clamshell and inside its chassis and you'll realize just how little heatsink surface even full-on gaming laptops have and what is there is shared between the CPU, GPU, VRAM and VRMs. You've got heat pipes that are connected across both the CPU and GPU and the GPU almost always gets more heatsink material as it's almost always the significantly more power hungry components and arguably more important for gaming performance anyway. To dissipate well over 100 watts from the GPU and up to 100 watts from the CPU, you need a whole lot of heatsink surface area for that heat to be expelled from the, the chassis and a lot of airflow going over those heatsinks too, hence the frequent jet turbine fans you find in laptops. In general, they trade noise for cooling efficiency, spinning their fans at three, four, five, six thousand RPM versus many PC fans that will barely take over at 500 to 1000 RPM and often max out at around 2000. They do have a very different sort of blade design as they're much more similar to a graphics card blower fan as these are front intake side exhaust fans rather than a desktop fan that's more straight through. Now, of course, you can solve the heat problem actually pretty easily by just adding more heating material and larger fans. But that comes with plenty of trade-offs. It will be thicker, which in a world where every single tech product that we have is constantly trying to be thinner and lighter, so that doesn't seem like a valid option. And it'll also be heavier, rather obviously thanks to the extra material, but it'll also be more expensive. There are plenty of gaming laptops that do even use actual desktop CPUs and sometimes GPUs like the Alienware Area 51M, but that's real thick and real expensive and still doesn't run quite as fast as a desktop with the same hardware, again thanks to thermals. So will a gaming laptop ever be as fast as a comparably spec desktop? Well, generally speaking, no. Mainstream machines like ASUS's Strix G15, Acer's Triton 500SE or Helios 300 or even XMG Core 15 likely won't be rocking any CPUs or GPUs that can match similarly specced or priced desktop parts anytime soon. And so long as we want the absolute most performance possible out of our laptops, they'll continue to run as hot as they physically can while in use. It is also worth noting that, generally speaking, the lifespan of silicon dyes like your CPU and GPU are based on their usage and especially the temperatures that they consistently run at. Laptop chips that run this hot are more likely to fail considerably sooner than a desktop chip that has been well cooled throughout its lifetime. It's not likely to be a concern in the laptop's usable lifespan, but it is probably worth mentioning, especially if you are the sort of person who tends to hold on to their you know, gaming laptops uh, for five or 10 years, even if it's just to have them running in the background, for example, it's worth noting. There are also some other rather interesting factors like the hardware spec and even things like the, the boost algorithms that the different components are using to turbo up or you know throttle back down. 
For example, an RTX 3080 laptop GPU, in theory, can offer more performance with the same power usage as an RTX 3070 or 3060 laptop chip, again, at the same power level. So you can vary that sort of performance that way. And also for things like your CPU boost algorithms, in general, AMD tends to be a little bit more conservative with how hard they will push the, the boost clocks and how quickly the chip will get to its maximum temperature and drop back down. Whereas Intel are much more aggressive in how quickly the chip will turbo to its maximum possible speed even if that's only for a brief instant before the chip overheats and then cuts back down off of, off of boost. And so that can also vary the performance you get out of it, as for example, the Ryzen chips tend to do better in longer workloads as they can manage their thermals a bit better and generally are more consistent in keeping higher boost clocks, whereas Intel tends to work really well for boosty or uh, bursty short workloads, but in anything longer tends to suffer a lot more. So that's a, a brief look at why gaming laptops almost always uh, instantly overheats and the sort of the differences in performance between desktop and laptop and the, the sort of view on that. Uh, if you have any thoughts yourself or any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. I'll leave some links to some gaming laptops in the description if you're interested. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can do that in a load of different ways, directly through the YouTube join button, right next to the subscribe button if you haven't already hit feel free to do so. Uh, but the YouTube join button gets you access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and some cool emojis to use in the comments on our weekly live streams. Or if you'd prefer, prefer to support on Patreon instead, you can do that in the description as well. There's also links to hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of the designs I made myself, or there's less direct ways to support the channel, like uh, the Overclock GK affiliate link, if you're buying from there, or a load of other affiliate links to places uh, well, like VPN options, Hubble Bar, No Stream Labs, OBS, and a whole lot of other stuff, so do feel free to check it out. Otherwise, there are plenty of more videos on the end cards if you want to keep watching. Maybe some of the laptop reviews, that might make sense. Uh, and otherwise, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, We'll see you on the next video.